welcome back. Um, so hopefully this will be a relatively short um, piece looking at uh, your rights as a journalist to take uh, pictures and video in a, uh, in a public space. Um, so um, there are lots of occasions when somebody, and quite often be a police officer, might challenge your right to take pictures <coughs> or to, uh, to film in a public place. Um, but um, you should be confident in your, um, your right to do that. Uh, so, um, yeah, so fundamentally it comes down to this, that the College of Policing, um, one of the bodies that uh, uh, develops policy uh, alongside uh, the Association of uh, Chief Police Officers, uh, etc., um, they, um, they acknowledge the right for journalists to take pictures um, and to report on incidents. Uh, and um, what they say is that uh, the media have a right to report from accident and crime scenes. And uh, you'll quite often turn up at a, an accident or a crime scene and police officers will not be particularly happy that you're there. They don't want you there. Um, but uh, the College of Policing uh, has, um, has said that we uh, have recognised our right to, do, to be there. Um, they also say not only that we have got a right to be there, that the, be the best practice is to provide a good vantage point for us to do our job, to, uh, to report on uh, what's going on. Um, so um, not only do, do they have to acknowledge our right to be there, but they should give us a good vantage point. Um, they uh, acknowledge uh, the simple fact that there's no criminal law restricting taking of photographs in a public place. So if you're in a public place, uh, you have an absolute right to take photographs. Now, you have to be careful about whether you are in a public place or not, so it's easy to, to get that wrong. So Media City, for instance, is actually not a public space. It's owned by Peel Holdings. It's, uh, it's actually a private piece of land uh, to which the public has access, um, which is why you need to get a filming permit uh, if you're doing anything there. So be careful about what's a public place. But if you're out in the street um, uh, and you're in a, in a, in a public street, um, there is no, nothing to restrict you taking photographs uh, of anything that is going on. Um, the police do not have a right to seize either a film or a camera on the ground um, just uh, by the fact that you're either refusing to stop taking photographs or because they don't like you taking photographs. If you're in a public space, you have an absolute right to do it and they do not have the right to seize uh, your film or camera unless they uh, have a reasonable suspicion that it uh, that what you've the pictures you've taken contain evidence of a crime. So if you've taken pictures of a bank robbery, uh, which is uh, that you saw going on, they may be able to seize your film uh, because it would be evidence of the uh, of the crime. But if you're just there in the aftermath uh, and you're filming the police operation, the forensics, the crowds, all this sort of stuff. They've got no right to seize uh, your equipment or your uh, footage. Um, nor do they have the power to order you to delete pictures. And that's something which you may come across where an officer, or well, it might be a security guard or anyone, um, may say uh, that you have to delete the pictures that you've taken. Um, they don't have that power. So uh, if somebody demands that you delete uh, pictures you should refuse, politely refuse, uh, but you, you should refuse and refer them to the College of Policing guidelines. Um, if you've left the scene, so if you've been at this bank robbery and you've taken some pictures in the aftermath um, and uh, the uh, uh, a police officer approaches you uh, having noticed that you've been there, they do not have the power to seize any of those images at all. Um, uh, this has to be done by a court order. Um, so once you're away from the scene, uh, they can't ask, uh, can't demand that you hand over anything. Even if you had pictures of uh, uh, of the incident, incident itself, they would have to have a court order um, to uh, to do that. Um, they've also got uh, no um, ability to stop you entering a public um, uh, or. Uh, private premises if you're um, invited by the um, uh, by the owner so um, there may be occasions where the police are saying you can't come into a into a house but if the uh, owner of the house is inviting you in then you can um, so again you need to be confident in your rights um, 
um, and also it sort of follows that if uh, a member of the public is uh, t says to a police officer to tell them to stop taking pictures um, and the police officer comes over to you they still do not have the power uh, to prevent you doing that there are some other things which constrain us of course uh, our um, uh, the laws of privacy uh, about whether we publish uh, film uh, or photographs of somebody who's uh, in a distressed state or an injured state. That doesn't stop us taking the photographs. What that does is uh, it uh, curtails our um, ability to publish them. So it might be that we take a picture of somebody who's in a distressed state but we then choose because of issues of privacy not to publish them. But that doesn't prevent us from actually taking the pictures in the first place. So if you're behaving reasonably, you're in a public place um, uh, and um, uh, you are not um, don't actually have evidence of a particular crime uh, the police have no power to stop you uh, taking pictures uh, and they have no power to seize your footage pictures or your equipment um, and they actually do have a, a professional duty according to the College of Policing to actually give you a good vantage point of what's going on all of that detail is in that link at the bottom. Again, the slides will be on Blackboard, so uh, have a look at that um, um, if you wish. Um, there are lots of reasons that police officers might choose to try and stop you. Um, um, now, of course, I'm assuming that you're behaving in a decent way and you're not doing any of these things, but some of the things that will get thrown at you will be that you're committing a public order offence by refusing to stop taking pictures. That's, un, uh, that's uh, not a justified uh, objection from a police officer, um, that they might say that you're obstructing the highway. If you're not obstructing a highway, if you're simply standing in a public place, uh, that's not legitimate. They might say you're obstructing the police. Uh, if you're not actually obstructing the police and actually doing their duty, if you're standing on a cordon taking pictures, um, that uh, cannot be uh, reasonably said to obstruct the police. Just being there is not an obstruction. Terrorism is more and more used uh, as a, um, a reason to stop um, uh, journalists going about their, their lawful um, uh, occupation. Uh, so um, uh, terrorism will be thrown at you sometimes and sometimes trespass. Uh, again, if you're in a public place and you're sure you're in a public place, you can't be accused of trespassing. Uh, and if you are accused of trespassing, uh, all that can, you can be uh, reasonably asked to do is to leave. Uh, they, can, I can't, they can't seize equipment on the basis of trespass. If you're, no matter which, no matter what you're um, confronted by or what allegations are being made against you, you need to remain calm and courteous and professional at all times really important you do that once you lose your rag um, then you've lost the argument uh, and then um, uh, if you're um, uh, starting to become uh, abusive to a police officer and that's uh, never going to end well uh, so uh, and then you actually give them good reason to uh, uh, to arrest you potentially um, so remain calm courteous but remain confident in your right to take pictures if you're in a public place and you're not causing any sort of obstruction I've put a couple of uh, videos, uh, normally I'd play them to you, but it doesn't really work very well within a uh, video lecture like this. So if you look, in, there's a folder called uh, videos of how um, of, of police um, preventing journalists taking pictures. And they're quite good because they give you quite a few different examples of how police officers have in real life tried to prevent um, journalists taking pictures. The first one there, the, uh, the top one, is of a, a police officer who just keeps on basically shuffling across and standing in front of the camera lens to prevent uh, a, uh, a photographer doing his um, doing his job and keeps putting his hand up in front of the lens and it's just silly really um, nothing nasty but the photographer is very professional uh, and just um, keeps moving and just kind of manages to get around things the middle one is a much nastier incident of a scottish police officer uh, who challenges um, somebody who's taking pictures at a cordon where there's been a, a road accident and um, actually becomes very threatening and intimidating and I think that police officer was um, disciplined uh, after that and the bottom uh, one there, bottom right, uh, it was um, it's in Lancashire and uh, that um, uh, actually led to the arrest of a photographer who was taking pictures in a street and they used the um, uh, justification of uh, anti-terror legislation to try and prevent this photographer from taking pictures in a public street uh, and it did end up with sort of a bit of a cat and mouse chase 
um, uh, it kept on challenging him at different places, and in the end, they arrested him, and it led to a, quite, a, quite a physical arrest of the photographer because he refused to uh, uh, delete uh, the pictures and, and stop taking the pictures. He was uh, he was doing it quite legitimately. So it will happen, and uh, it's important you feel confident in your legal knowledge to uh, uh, assert your rights to take pictures. So that's um, uh, that issue about taking um, uh, your taking pictures in a public place and say, look at those videos, uh, they're, they're interesting. And in each case, the photographer was um, perfectly justified in taking the pictures they were taking and the police were uh, wrong in, the, in uh, the way that they, uh, they went about uh, their job. Um, coroner's courts are um, is another area I just want to talk very briefly about because we've touched on coroner's courts, but I'm just aware that we haven't really uh, talked about them specifically. So. Um, Coroner's courts, um, what do they do? So they're a kind of court, so but they're not the kind of court that find people guilty or not guilty. They're not there to apportion blame. What they're there for is to investigate certain types of death. Um, so uh, a coroner who uh, basically sits uh, in the place of the judge in a coroner's court um, will uh, hold an inquest. That's what the kind of hearing that gets held at a coroner's court. Um, and it'll be if there's an unknown cause to the death or if it's happened during state detention so if they were in prison on a police cell um, or if um, they were um, uh, if it was a violent or unnatural death so if it's a, a crime or a, a road accident uh, a potential suicide something of that sort uh, a, an inquest would be held to investigate the circumstances of that death and what they do is instead of a portion blame, so they don't say this person was responsible or not, uh, they establish the facts of the death. So they uh, establish the identity of the person who's died, and then they also look at how, when, and where uh, that death took place. So they're establishing the facts. So it does not decide on criminal responsibility. Witnesses can be called to testify to try and establish the facts of the death. Um, certain circumstances but not all they might have juries and you remember whenever there's a jury around you need to be really really careful because that's where any prejudicial information that you publish could have a prejudicial impact on the jury and so the contempt of court act applies uh, to those cases in uh, um, uh, to to inquests just as much as um, as it does to um, uh, criminal uh, court cases and in the end at the end of a an inquest, um, the coroner will come up with a um, a verdict, um, and uh, well, they're known as verdicts, but their proper name is determinations. Um, and um, either the coroner or the jury, if there's a jury sitting, uh, they may uh, come up with what they call a short form determination. So that might be something like suicide, or unlawful killing, or misadventure, something of that sort. So that's like a, a one word or a couple of words which sum it up. Um, until they've come up with that um, that verdict, we can't call it a suicide, for instance. So if somebody has fallen from a building, uh, we need to be very careful not to uh, say somebody has committed suicide uh, uh, by falling from a building today. It's up to the coroner's court to decide whether it's a suicide. Once they've ruled that it was a suicide, then we can call it a suicide. But until they've decided, we have to say hey, somebody died from falling might say a suspected suicide but it'd be better just to give the circumstances you know that the person died after falling from a building until the coroner's court has uh, uh, has ruled on the, uh, the cause of death then uh, we can't uh, jump the gun on that quite often increasingly it seems uh, coroners come up with narrative verdicts so that uh, they don't come up with a single short form they won't say it was a suicide or it was an unlawful killing they'll come up with a couple of sentences which sum up the um, uh, uh, sum up the situation uh, about how that person died. From a journalistic point of view that's quite annoying because it's uh, they're usually long and it's quite difficult to then write around exactly what it is that, uh, that happened but uh, sometimes family it spares the, the feelings of families rather than coming up with just a blunt uh, determination like a suicide if um, uh, is a narrative verdict which maybe takes into account some of the nuances of what uh, what happened so look out for narrative verdicts um, as well um, it's important to know that uh, you can have an inquest uh, which is uh, opened 
Uh, now, of course, if it's somebody who's been shot to death, uh, it's an unnatural uh, killing, so therefore there will be an inquest. But uh, if there are criminal proceedings, uh, so if someone's uh, been accused of shooting somebody, um, they will be arrested and then charged with murder or, or whatever, probably murder, um, uh, and uh, they will face a trial. So the inquest will also open because it needs to be a, that needs to be opened in order to release the body to the family in order to, so they can have a funeral. Um, but uh, while the criminal proceedings are ongoing, the inquest will uh, will be adjourned, so it will be delayed uh, until after the criminal case is finished. So the criminal case takes priority because the uh, the uh, inquest. Um, uh, doesn't want to come up with a, for instance, an unlawful killing verdict before the uh, um, the criminal court has um, has worked its way through the case. It doesn't want to jump the gun and making any decisions which might prejudice the criminal case. So yes, it'll open, but then it, it will adjourn until the criminal case is over and done with. The person is either found guilty or not guilty of murder, uh, and then the, the inquest will resume and they'll come up with their determination. Um, yeah, just be aware that uh, normal, all the law that you've been learning about the criminal and civil courts also applies uh, in uh, the coroner's courts. So especially things like contempt, um, be really careful about that. But access to a coroner's court, um, uh, you have the right to access to coroner's courts unless there is a, an order placed uh, for good reason, uh, banning information. And also you can challenge uh, orders that are made within a coroner's court. But just be careful in a coroner's court, be particularly careful because coroner's courts by definition uh, have a lot of bereaved people, will generally have bereaved people there. The, the person whose death is being investigated as part of that inquest, their family is likely to be there. Um, and um, again, because it will be an unexpected or unexplained or violent uh, death, it will be particularly traumatic. So you do need to be really careful um, in the way that you approach people and uh, what it is you say and do so if you're talking on the phone to someone to be respectful uh, always assume that somebody else can hear what you're saying if you're in and around uh, a coroner's court um, okay so that's uh, coroner's courts um, to us on this so you've got a right to take pictures in a public place yes the, there may be times when the police may uh, try and stop you but you need to be confident in your right and your knowledge of your rights the police are generally brilliant um, and some of your best contacts uh, will be police officers and many police officers are really really helpful so don't come away from this thinking that the police are the enemy they're absolutely not the enemy uh, they're generally really really useful and helpful uh, people to us as journalists and most of them understand our role as, uh, as journalists and, uh, and work with us rather than against us but occasionally you will come up against somebody and maybe they're just having a bad day uh, and we'll have bad day um, bad days as well so uh, um, so um, but if you do bump up against a police officer who's having a bad day and they try and prevent you taking pictures, refer them to the College of Policing guidelines and say that you're aware that you do have a right to take pictures in a public place and they have no right to, uh, to prevent you from doing that. And in coroner's courts, uh, important uh, area, you can get great stories out of coroner's courts, but be careful around them because of uh, the sensitivities and they're there to establish the facts around someone's death, not to apportion blame. Um, okay so that's uh, all I wanted to cover this week the reading for um, this week is um, Nays chapters 30 to 36 make sure you've had a read of all of those for this week uh, if you want to get ahead of the reading for next week so you're going to be with Sarah Hadwin next week uh, for media regulation and ethical codes so you're going to be looking at those um, so that's uh, McNay's chapters 2 3 and 4 so have a look at those three chapters for next week and if you really want to get ahead, um, the following week, which is week 10, uh, you'll be back with me and we're going to be talking about copyright in that week. Uh, and that's uh, McNay's chapter 29. So have a look at uh, that if you want. But certainly for this week, chapters 30 to 36, looking at all issues of freedom of expression. I'll see you at the, uh, the workshop on Thursday. Um, and we'll run through some typical exam questions to do with freedom of expression. Um, and uh, in the meantime, thanks for your attention. Cheerio.